Hi, how you going? Today I wanted to bend your ear about lean agile procurement. You know, what is it? Why do I care? Where's it come from? All that good stuff. So agile has been going for a while. You know, we know it's been around since mid nineties, been rolling forward, growing, expanding. The challenge with flexible contracts has been around for a long time and we saw this in the the book by uh, Craig Larman and Bas Vodder. There's been some great work by Gabrielle Benefield. Uh, we're pairing with a lawyer to create a, a flexible contract. It hasn't really reached through the organisation though. So what is this lean agile procurement stuff? Why do I care? How does it fit? Well, it does what it says on the tin. It's applying lean and agile concepts to procurement. In many ways, I think procurement and legal are the last departments that are starting to be engaged with in an agile adoption, which is ironic because they're a huge enabler for what we can achieve. So how does it fit, where did we go from? So we had that work being done and then Mirko Kleiner came up with this pattern of big room planning and started the Lean Agile Procurement Alliance. When I met uh, Mirko at a conference, we were both speaking and he would ran me through the ideas and I thought this, this is really important, this is a game changer. Because at the time I was working with a, a very large company, a multinational, and often the challenges that I found as a supplier trying to engage and connect with services was really tricky. And as the company, there's a lot of challenges in complex procurement. When we're working in heavily regulated industries, when we've got a lot of oversight, finding and selecting partners and managing the risk of working with other people is probably the number one challenge for procurement. Price and financial control is very important as well, but the main thing is ensuring they're a good fit and managing the risk. So how does it work? How does lean agile procurement work? In much the same way as traditional procurement, but to a much shorter time frame. So there's four real phases. The first phase is the preparation where we get clarity from within the company. What is it that we're trying to procure? How can we make sure that when we're talking to potential partners, they're bringing the right materials, techniques, processes and approach to help us solve the problem? What's the business need? Start with the why. So that preparation should be done in a couple of weeks and we'll use classic agile techniques such as business canvases, uh, personas, black backlogs, all that good stuff. So this is the thing that we need to do. We then enter into the preparation phase where we'll talk to potential partners and say, look, we would like to run this in a different way we would like to use lean agile procurement. That means you will be coming into a room with other potential partners and together we're going to co-create a working agreement and co-create the contract. So the preparation phase will need some education of potential partners. It'll need to put some appropriate uh, legal scaffolding in place, some non-disclosure uh, non agreements, um, base terms and conditions if they're the sort of things that either organization is looking at so that when everybody comes into the big room event we can share that it is a safe place so that we can trust and realize that no organization is going to be jeopardized by losing ip by exposure to competitors effectively and then in the big room event, it's a two day typically, maybe longer, three day. But in that time frame, the contracts are written 
and agreed and negotiated and signed. So at the end of big room planning, we then start executing. And the key here is to go from months to days. Shortening that time frame and also baking flexibility and adaptation into our commercial frameworks and agreements so that we can create a win-win situation between the company and the partner. Um, so why, why do it this way? To ensure that we're managing our risk, to ensure that our potential partners are a good fit for us, that they're an appropriate partner for our organization, and also to learn as quickly as possible. So to be adaptive, to be fast, and to establish the commercials around adaptation so that we can create a resilient business ecosystem to thrive in. The reason this matters, the world is moving faster. It's getting messier. It's getting more chaotic. Often, um, the chance of things being volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous is increasing. How do you create the correct preconditions for your teams to work in an iterative, incremental, and adaptive way? Because if our contracts and our structures are written in a very milestone, predictive planning way, we'll end up with some obvious tensions and if your money is flowing in a very classic predictive way it's going to hamstring your partnerships from working in an adaptive way setting up for success is the key and that's the reason i fell in i thought yeah this is this is really important this is so so important because I've been on both sides, trying to find people to work with as well as providing services to other organizations. And a lot of times it comes down to a simple race to the bottom. Price is not always the only number you want to care about. Now, big procurement, you might be procuring something worth, I don't know, a few million. If you can save 10% on that, that's a few hundred thousand. But if it takes you nine months, the cost of delay is more than that 10%. And flipping that outlook from, oh, let's just try and get 10%, let's go for something bigger and look at the cost of delay and the impact across the bigger business. Being able to have an adaptive agreement with our partners to allow flexibility to change without punitive clauses, that's going to yield a whole lot more value. And that's what excites me. As we move through this century, the way that we build ecosystems of partners collaboratively creating win-win situations to support each other, achieving business goals, will be even more important. That way we can cope with whatever shocks the world throws at us when, I don't know, a container ship gets stuck and all of a sudden we're finding container traffic can't get through. When there's a disruption to a particular market, how do we respond to that in such a way that our business can be sustainable? I'd like to share my journey with LAP and how I got to being now part of the board. So I met with Mirko and did my train the trainer and we're working on helping people understand it. And that was in 2019. And then the joy of COVID happened, which meant everything pivoted. And so since then I've been delivering some training on it, but it hasn't been enough of a focus and this year I want to drink my sham own champagne and limit my whip and focus on moving the needle on lean agile procurement because it is such a huge enabler 
And for that reason, I was delighted to join the board. So on the board are five really super experienced agilists and people who care about procurement and have worked in many, many sectors, many industries, working with leadership, working with teams. So from the, the teams that are actually delivering it all the way through the leadership, throughout uh, organizations. So Mirko was the founder and within his collective, there is also Philip Engsler. Both of these chaps, hugely experienced agilists. They have run departments, organizations, consulted, trained, coached. Paolo Samicelli has done a huge amount of work in agile hardware, has run his own business, runs multiple um, workshops and trainings that support agility, particularly in hardware. That's his book that he's got out recently. It's a really good book. Sophie Durand is working in France and has worked with government as well as charities, bringing lean agile procurement to life and into action and myself. So please go on to the lean agile procurement website where you can read more about the five board members. And our mission is to help lean agile procurement be used to help our trainer community get access to better materials, um, innovate and to build on the great work that they're doing, helping their clients, helping their customers use lean agile procurement for the mutual win of companies and partners. And you can see that in the case studies, you can see that in what has worked where time has been saved, where money has been saved, and that focus on value and learning and innovation is there. So what are the big problems? Like, if we're going to be drinking the Agile Champagne, we should be focusing on the need. Why is it needed? Basically, there's three things. Only for complex stuff, though. Like it's, 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 if you're buying staples or paper, your traditional approaches are perfect. But when it comes to complex work, there's three really significant challenges. The first one is time to action. How long does it take you to find a partner and to bring the work in? And in the same way that we've seen with agile development, procurement, there is a, a fast route for procurement. If you need something really quickly, it can happen. So. Why don't we use that all the time? The second thing is a flexible contract, creating that space for adaptation, for iterative incremental learning without punitive clauses. And the third thing is finding a good cultural fit between your potential partners and your companies so that we build partnerships sustainable, nurtured partnerships so that we can grow this. So how big is this problem? Well, the time to market thing, uh, it's often months. And the process of getting to action, it's quite bureaucratic. It's very heavy, particularly if you're regulated if we have got concerns about bribery, if we're talking about fairness, if we've got a balanced scorecard that has to be achieved, there is a lot of work that you have to do. And every time a potential partner asks a question, you have to supply them with the answer and the interest of fairness, we then have to communicate that out to all the partners. So we find ourselves in rounds of communication. So we've got the RFP, response to that, response to the questions, and it's a back and forth. If we have everybody in the room that is resolved because everybody hears everyone else's questions. From the partners, potential partners perspective, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, pounds, euro, preparing to respond to a tender, putting the work in to fill out the, the documentation to communicate that. The win for them is 
by spending less time and being in the room, their actual cost is reduced and they will get feedback in the moment as to how to improve. We have also seen uh, conglomerates form in big room planning because they work out that they can solve the problem by immediately pairing together. So we can have organizations forge this. And we did see this with one of the COVID vaccines, the three big farmers got together and just went handshake agreement, let's, let's build something. And so it can be done. So that time to action is a huge thing that is resolved by using this approach. The second thing is the flexible contracts. Now, many base patterns for this, time and materials, fixed price. The, the key with the big room session and discussing this is trying to find the win-win. And this is why it becomes a partnership. Because if we can balance the risk and the reward, it shouldn't be so one-sided that one party has all the risk and therefore logically should have all the reward. Now, if the company is going to take some risk, surely having your partners engage in that risk and thereby measuring their reward by having a focus on outcomes and a clarity of the goal means we've got shared ownership. Shared ownership means we've got an investment in time and principle in ensuring that the outcome is achieved. Now, if we write our flexible contract in such a way, let's say we really are doing Agile correctly and we've got a hypothesis that we believe that and if we do this, then that will happen. What about if we learn that if we do this, we have an unexpected outcome and that means the product's non-viable? Well, we have very clear exit calls in there to manage the risk on both sides. What about if we run an experiment and we learn something and we need to pivot? Because we have a flexible contract, we can then pivot with no penalty clauses, with no further cost apart from continuing to work. Now, once we've written the flexible contract once, that also means that we can renegotiate our contract as needed. So it's not written once and then executed forever, as needed, we can adapt our contract. So that flexibility truly becomes an enabler for the whole organization to be agile because it's permeating this it, the whole idea of transparency, inspection, adaptation based on trust and values. And that leads us to the third point, which is cultural fit. Some people have uh, likened the big room planning session to speed dating between suppliers and the company. We prefer the term partners because we're looking for that partnership model. Now, I was running a session last Friday and somebody said, dude, I've run something very similar to this. And it was interesting because some suppliers self-selected out of it. So their willingness to engage in this process or not means that you've already filtered out the people who want to come and play. And that cultural fit reduces friction because it will build trust. And we've got the precondition, the desire to want to work together culturally. And then we can put the commercials with that. And if we've got a commercial fit and a cultural fit, there is a better probability that we will achieve the positive outcome that we're looking for to solve the need. This will save money down the track because we don't have to deal with disputes. We don't have to go into some of the clause work. What, what's the old joke? You know, contracts are a bit like uh, locks. They're only there for honest people. You know, because as a lawyer once said, if you get to arguing about the contract, you've already lost. So the contract is really a framing constraint where we try and shape how we're going to work together in a constructive way. And this flexible contract should also reduce any surprises from either the company side 
or the supplier side because you build in the feedback loop into the contract. So they're the big three, time to action, flexible contract and cultural fit. And those three things when combined together gives us the agility to be able to respond to a changing marketplace. It will probably come as no surprise to you, but the benefits are the flip side of the pain, right? And we've already talked about them. So the first thing is setting yourself up for adaptation, being able to have a flexible response without a punitive clause. This enables us to have reduced costs. How many times have you had an organization in your organization, have you struggled with a change request? Actually stopping delivering the thing or building the thing to review the upcoming change, forecasting that, and then going through the process of signing off that change request. Another classic approach that predictive contracts or traditional approach has given us is it'll be a fixed price contract and then buried deep in there will be the cost per change request. I've seen this happen with a number of suppliers and they would always argue it was not a bug, it's a change request because the cost of to them, that's where they made their money. So they gave a very low initial price and knowing that there were going to be changes, they then made the change request cost very high. And so the whole idea of, you know, are we will take a 10% hit on the fixed price contract. They were quite happy with that because they knew they'd make the money back on the change request. What about if we're more open up front and we're looking at about a net value proposition so that we've got that freedom and adaptability in there. So having that from the outset, that we're open to learning, that we're open to adaptation is really, really important. Tying into that, sharing the risk and reward profile means that we build an agile ecosystem. We've got partnerships. Now, if you have got a key piece of work that you're looking for support with, you don't wanna break that potential supplier you need them to remain commercially viable. Otherwise, you're just exposing your organization to a tremendous amount of risk. And this is where conglomerates, shared partnerships, splitting the portfolio could all be done in the big room planning. And that diversification to manage your risk is a really key thing. And the third thing is the essence of agility. Like nobody should be doing agility for the sake of it. The whole reason we do agility is to build business resilience and to be able to turn on a dime for a dime. This enables that because from the outset, we're saying we want to be able to change and we want to be lean on that cost of change. And it's all about finding that sweet spot for your organization, for the particular piece of work that you're looking for within your business context. Now, if you ever have the privilege of working with a pharmaceutical company or an energy company, you'll know that the numbers that they start having to work with are very, very large because the work they're doing is so complex and expensive to build and run. Either way, it's proportional. I would suggest as a small business, you're probably very focused on the volume of capital that you're dealing with. How could it work? Well, it's the same way for everyone. It helps you be very clear about risk, reward, margins, and change so that you can find the best potential partners to support the delivery towards your organization's purpose. So in conclusion, the challenge or the invitation, it's not a challenge, it's an invitation. What's the smallest experiment you could run that would help you test the waters with this? 
could you use this process for a discussion between two teams within your organization? Okay, it takes the commercial piece out of the picture probably, but it will help you practice and rehearse the process and so that then you can find the best way to collaborate. Then you might feel comfortable and ready to move it up and use this as a technique with suppliers you're already working with people you already trust. So then you can then throw it open and look to the wider public. What's the smallest experiment you can run to get the pace of change and get the idea of using this thing running? Because if you don't, somebody else will and that might give them the competitive advantage what's holding you back <laughs>